welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Joanne Roberts, for those of you who I don't know, uh, former interim leader of uh, the Green Party of Canada. And um, one of the things that COVID interrupted halfway through, so I was had a stretch where it was regular times and then halfway through my time as interim leader, COVID hit. Um, and I was the candidate uh, for the Green Party in Victoria in 2015 and here in Halifax in 2019. And I'm thrilled to say we have an outstanding panel tonight to talk about um, COVID and climate change. And I think if we think about COVID uh, and we think of what did we sell out of uh, here in the country, it was bicycles, first of all, after toilet paper. Um, and suddenly we were short of yeast because we were cooking at home and people were discovering, uh, oh gosh, you know, grandma's old recipe for uh, bread really works. Uh, and then we, we kind of made that pivot, uh, and I'm sure we'll, we'll speak to this if you're in the food industry, uh, and tried to find out, can we do takeout? What does our customer want if they're not sitting in our restaurant? And look at us here on Zoom. The technology that some of us had to embrace uh, during COVID, it, it, I think it, it took all of us to another level. And uh, we're fortunate in having someone here who is uh, an expert in technology in our lives. So we look at Zoom and we look at supporting local. Suddenly, I think many of the things that uh, this panel that we have together had been saying for many years, not new, uh, about what we needed to be seeing in our world, what we needed to be doing in our lives so that we did not end up in catastrophic situations, suddenly started to make more sense to people. So that's what we're going to explore tonight. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to, we have that panel that can look at transportation, that can look at farming and local business, that can look at food supply, and that can look at science and technology. Wow. Uh, so let's get started. What I'm going to do is give each panelist a series of, of questions, three questions, very much the same for each panelist. And they will have, we hope to have those three questions sort of answered in about a five minute window. So I'm gonna introduce a panelist, put the questions out. And uh, then at the end, I'm gonna ask the panelists to comment on what each other said. So we'll have a little bit of an internal discussion with our panel, and then we'll open it to questions from the floor. So, Make notes of questions you want to ask, and uh, we will be getting there. So I am going to start with Megan Doucette. Uh, Megan is the executive director of the Halifax Cycling Coalition. She's passionate about equity and urban issues. She holds a Bachelor of Man Management with a major in environmental sustainability from Dalhousie, and uh, then went on to do a Master's of Urban Planning at McGill. A deep commitment to challenging inequitable structures in our society influences her work as an advocate for safe and affordable mobility options. And I love that she's dreaming of building a city that allows all residents to have access to what they need and to travel safely using the transportation mode of their choice. I think that's a world we can all get behind. Welcome, Megan. Thank you so much. Let's start with what do you think we have learned about transportation, especially in the urban sort of situation uh, that is positive during COVID? Yeah, so a lot has changed with transportation um, during the pandemic and um, it's kind of ebbed and flowed as the different lockdowns and things like that um, have changed over the past year. Um, but initially what we saw was a huge reduction of vehicle traffic um, and then also combined with people feeling less comfortable on, on transit, um, also a little bit of um, scheduling issues with transit and things like that. Um, so that became a little bit less attractive um, in terms of wanting to maintain distance and, and um, yeah, kind of keep, you, people wanted to be in their own kind of personal space, um, so they weren't exposing themselves to the virus. Um, so cycling really emerged as a preferred mode of transportation um, during this time. And so 
Um, as the streets were, were no longer filled up with cars, we saw the streets fill up with bikes, um, which is amazing. And so in Halifax um, in 2017, they passed something called the Integrated Mobility Plan. Um, so they've been working on building out this network of bike lanes um, for the last few years. Um, and we're seeing some of those come to fruition already. So on South Park Street and Hollis Street, um, the Hollis Street bike lane was just built last year. And then um, we also saw because of the pandemic and the increased um, demand for active transportation modes um, like cycling, um, the city put in some temporary infrastructure. So they put in some protection for the lower water street bike lane. Um, they extended the rainy drive bike lane um, down by um, Citadel Hill down to Brunswick Street and um, they also made some temporary changes to the intersection uh, at the Hydrostone Market to make it safer for people to bike through um, on Islesville. So we've seen a lot of these kind of um, tactical or temporary changes to our streets to try to make it safer for people to walk and bike. Um, the ones I just mentioned had a little bit more physical protection than some other measures that the city took. So they also um, provided um, something called slow street. So they took uh, quieter residential streets and put up um, some uh, barriers and signage to mark those as slow streets. We saw those um, being a little bit less successful uh, in, in that they didn't really do what they were intended to do. Um, the, the actual level of traffic wasn't necessarily reduced and because there, there were less people driving on the roads, people tended to be going quickly because there wasn't as much in their way. So the slow streets maybe need a little bit of tweaking still, um, but we saw a lot of um, positive changes. Okay, so you've touched on what maybe didn't qu quite work the way people had hoped, but would you say there were negatives that came out of COVID that you're worried might linger uh, or influence us uh, going forward into recovery? Yeah, I mean, from an environmental standpoint, I think, you know, I'm advocating for cycling all day, but in terms of actually shifting people out of cars on a mass scale, transit is really important. Um, so the fact that transit's become less um, appealing for people, I think that's going to be a challenge going forward. Um, when people are making that choice of, am I going to drive um, or am I going to choose another mode? Transit tends to be um, an easier mode for people to want to switch to. So I think that that's going to be a challenge um, as like four years kind of going forward. Um, and yeah, I would say that's one, but I definitely think that biking is, is on the up and up. <laughs> um, and one cool thing about um, the last couple of years also is that the city started to implement um, bike counters around town so when they're building new bike lanes they'll put in a counter so unfortunately we don't have a lot of baseline data from before the the bike lanes went in to compare but we can see now year over year how cycling is increasing um and so far uh so good yeah so i'm going to move on from there but i am going to ask you to think because the last question i want to do a go around on is then what do we take out of this as we move forward? Because it's interesting, you talk about, you know, people were not as keen to get on transit. Um, but I wonder if people might, because we've enjoyed not having busy streets and because we are starting to see more bike lanes and integration of cycling and public transit, if we may start to see people, you know, putting the bike on the bus and getting to a spot where they feel comfortable and taking it off. It, it'll be an interesting thing. Can we make that shift? So we'll get back to that. Okay, we're going to move on now to thank you to Thomas Trappenberg. Uh, Thomas, no stranger to those of us here uh, in uh, the Halifax area and around the province. Uh, but let me just remind you of some of his great accomplishments. He earned a PhD in physics and uh, is now a professor of computer science at Dow, specializing in artificial intelligence and com computational neuroscience. But he's also co-founded several companies. Um, Thomas is a very practical person with his science, uh, including real data. This is one I have a real interest in that applies AI in aquaculture and Nexus Robotics that builds a weeding robot. I have seen it, it does work and it's won uh, national, international competitions. He's currently part of a major effort to build 
detailed habitat maps of the North Atlantic Ocean and the, with the aim to record the effects of climate change in the oceans. This is something I didn't know about Thomas till recently. Climate change has been a major concern of his ever since his father, who was a meteorologist, that's the part I didn't know, told him about the effects of temperature shifts over 40 years ago. So not a surprise, Thomas has been ahead of the curve. Uh, he has run as a Green Party candidate in numerous provincial and federal elections since 2006. And uh, as the former leader of the Green Party of Nova Scotia, he led the party for five years. Um, so Thomas, my questions for you, you are a scientist and um, very involved in new technology. What have we learned, do you think, that has been positive in those fields um, in this, during this pandemic? Well, uh, thank you, Joan. Um, so I, th I think that the first thing overall is, the, you know, if we can say the beauty of COVID, I mean, there's a lot of negatives, but I mean, it showed us that first of all, things can happen and uh, that we could be able to adapt. And, and this is, you, you know, we should think about the strength of our society. Um, and I really truly believe in that. Indeed, during this last year, I did a lot of thinking and um, I think I came out more positive um, about our abilities, what we can do. So, so for example, um, we have seen during the first shutdown that there was a lot of really uh, positive effects. Of course, the reduction of the pollution was amazing. You know, just having less uh, uh, air traffic um, that people had to uh, uh, just commute less. Um, we, we heard of already, of course, uh, bike sales, uh, they spiked. Um, people, uh, people got connected with Zoom, uh, with, with people they haven't seen for a long time. So we kind of start embracing some technology which can be used positive, at the same time also learning, you know, what is really missing, that we can't do everything over Zoom. But um, I, I think what I have, uh, especially last year, really thought a lot about it. What are all these things we were working on over the last years can be put now to good use? There are real, especially in Nova Scotia, you know, we I actually a lot of other people, I know my friends in Germany, they, are, they have an envy. We have this space, we have a sun index, which is much higher than Europe or in Germany. And uh, so we have so many opportunities here, which the other uh, countries are really uh, struggling with. So, so I think um, what I have seen, uh, thinking about what I have done in the past and what we could now put to real use, uh, that is really the positive, and I, I strongly believe in that. Now, there's also been a bit of a change in how we um, embrace science. I don't know if we're completely there yet, but one of the things that we started to see quite com to be common in this was politicians uh, were listening way more to scientists than they used to, which is a good thing. Okay, what about the negative then, Thomas? If you take a look at the pandemic, where do you think maybe science and technology may have failed us or is that we're seeing it in a negative light? Well, well actually, um, uh, let me um, uh, pick up where, what you just mentioned, that like, does politics listen to science? And, and that's actually an interesting one. And especially um, with the example of climate change and, uh, and, and COVID. So first climate change, I, I should say, so climate change or, or the danger of climate change due to burning fossil fuels has been predicted over a hundred years ago. Actually, more than that, 120 years, end of the um, 19th century, people have, scientists have worked on this and have worked out, you know, um, what are the effects of carbon in our atmosphere. Um, of course, it has now been, been proven that, uh, you know, and, and by the way, um, uh, it has also turned out that the, the predictions of the scientists have been more correct and bleak than the politically moderated IPCC report. You know, we are, we are always now saying, oh, we are actually of the worst kind. And so, so I think for me, the, the most important is, um, actually, let, let me come also to COVID. We, we did, we did uh, know that there will be a pandemic. I mean, scientists have worked on that and they have worked out what we have to do in this uh, circumstance. So, so first politicians failed because they thought, oh, well, I don't feel it. I don't think it's important. So again, here's something with science. The one thing you have to understand, we can 
uh, we can work out formulas and we can predict things in the future which are not in our guts. But that's the beauty of science. We can, you know, we can make predictions and we have to learn to take this seriously. And, and we see that this has not always been done. I mean, yesterday, the discussions about Ontario, how, how uh, Ontario has actually not uh, listened to the advice uh, of, a, of the third wave in particular. Um, and we have seen that jurisdictions who have listened to, to, to science have done much better. So, so there, this is really, um, I think, uh, uh, listening to science is important. And, and here's, but here's, here's one, one, so I thought about, I mean, I went into politics because I thought as a scientist, I can help. I can, you know, have a unique perspective. I now think a little bit different. I, I don't think it would help us if we just elect all scientists in the, in the legislature. I think that the point is here how we work together. And how we work together is what, what we are common in science is we love to discuss. We love to be open. We love to come all together and that we truly, truly discuss things openly. And, and this is what is missing in, in, in politics. You know, how our current governments likes to do things in the back room. Um, you know, how, how even, you know, with the good old politics is you're saying one thing, but do something else. And, and kind of smart politicians don't say certain things. I, I don't think this is good. This is just not helpful. So we need a collaborative way, an open environment where we come finally together and solve things and not, you know, keep things in yeah. the back room. And, and if that is, if we can see the negative in when we didn't do that and learn from the positive, you're right, we'd be all further ahead. Um, I'm going to move on to Lil now, but I, one thing I do want to say to make very clear before we move forward is while I'm asking our panelists to look for the, the positives that we've seen, I think we all acknowledge uh, right away that um, there has been a great deal of uh, grief uh, in COVID and uh, this pandemic has, uh, has meant that families have uh, lost loved ones and that people have had serious challenges to their health. And I do not want to make light of that. Um, the topic we're dealing with is COVID and climate change and we are trying to look for some of the positive lessons we can take moving forward. Uh, but that does not mean in any way that, that this pandemic uh, has not been a hardship and, um, and caused great grief. So I, just in case you're just joining us, you're going, how can they be talking about this in a positive way? I want that to be acknowledged. Uh, we are reaching Lil McPherson at her farm in the Tatamagosh area. Lil is a born and bred Nova Scotian and the founder and co-owner of the Two Wooden Monkey Restaurants. Uh, she's also a trained presenter with Al Gore's Climate Change Project and has had attended the climate change conferences in Copenhagen and Cancun and Paris. Also someone who's been at this a long time. Her passion remains though, and uh, this is seen in the Wooden Monkey restaurants, local issues concerning food security and sustainability and supporting Nova Scotia farmers. Now she is one. Uh, she has been sharing her message with anyone uh, in any place, schools and community groups. And uh, she likes to say that she turns her attention to anyone who eats food. So there you go. One of her favorite things to do is something she has been able to do a lot during uh, this pandemic, and that is to get to the mountain farm and hop on her tractor. Nice to see you again, Lil. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> and thank you for... Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I was just going to say, you know, you're a small business owner and a farmer, a, a combination of two groups uh, that have been effective, affected by the pandemic. And so I'm wondering uh, which hat you wear when I ask you what are the lessons, the positive lessons we've learned from the pandemic? Well, I'm in the, the two of the worst businesses right now. It's pretty crazy. I mean, it's a uh, it's been it's been really tough, but actually I do try to find the positives uh, in, in this situation. And I will say one of the first positive lessons I've learned during the pandemic is I can really hold more liquor than I thought I could. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> and I, I realized too that that during uh, these times uh, we have to learn to laugh and have laughter somewhere to get us through this. But 
I, I will admit, honestly, uh, uh, dealing with climate change mentally, I find harder than the pandemic. And I, I have to admit that. I mean, as much as the pandemic has closed my business and we laid off staff and I'm worried about the farmers, climate change just, it just trumps everything. And, uh, you know, this pandemic, we can, you know, self-isolate, we can get a vaccine, we can hide from it. I'm up in a farm, I feel safe. But climate change, you can't anywhere. So it's almost like the pandemic has given us an opportunity in a strange way. And it's been so much sadness. I'm glad you, you mentioned that, Joanne. Uh, but also, like, it really kind of blew me away and gave me hope that when we see the globe, uh, you know, the whole global community getting together and, and uh, making some drastic changes quickly in an emergency, I thought, wow, we can we can do this this is this was a real uh hopeful thing that I, that i saw and um and i do realize and i think everybody does too that what happens on the other side of the world affects us here and these are just lessons in in food systems and i thought okay this is uh just because it's way over in china doesn't mean it's going to not affect us and it does so but i also felt it was very positive um the first big global shutdown or the shutdown of the world that the emissions decline i'm glad thomas you mentioned that and i really found it that spring a lot of new birds came to the farm uh, it was like extremely noticeable so it gave me hope that nature can rebound when when we when we allow to have the space and the, and the atmosphere to do that so and I find uh, people found it um, and they've learned a valuable lesson uh, to have business at home and how we depending on the global economy is just uh, for everything we need is just dangerous. And uh, this, especially the supply chain, uh, like our food is very reckless. So I, I really think that came up big time. People were calling me and emailing me and where can I get food? Where can I get local food? I spoke to many of my farmers and one particularly said, I can't believe this. My sales have tripled the first shutdown because she had so many new phone calls. So people were scared about buying, you know, you know, imported food and they wanted to really stay close to home. So I will definitely speak more on that, but that's that's definitely a lot of the positives I've seen. All right. And if we take a look at the negatives and uh you know, I think you do touch on something that a lot of us are maybe not wanting to turn our eyes to is this pandemic has shown many people who didn't want to look at what happens when we have a global crisis. Um, but it ha it can't help but sort of wake us up a little bit to, if we've been ignoring climate, that climate is a big part of this. Uh, so what do you see as the negatives in this right now, though? Well, the negatives are, are what I've been talking about still. It really scares me. Nova Scotia is still very food insecure. We depend on 90% uh, of our food comes from away. Uh, that's a terrible business model. It's a very dangerous business model, especially us being up north, being almost an island. It could become an island because of climate change. So, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and honestly, uh, you know, on a personal note, the very reason uh, climate change was the reason why I opened the Wooden Monkey. I was uh, very scared about the food insecurity 16 years ago. I've been saying this and, and, uh, you know, just to open up to help to to uh, support, the, you know, a new, you know, farming community, the infrastructures we need to come back. I realized that I didn't think of a pandemic would actually, you know, bring this to light, but wow, it blew me away. So, you know, and, and I am starting a farm, even though I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but it's really quite amazing. And I'm having all the anxieties and, and feeling like a farmer, uh, you know, how much food should I should I grow? I'm, I've hired a full-time farmer myself, uh, a woman farmer, awesome. And we're, and I don't know how much food to, to grow. I'm investing a lot of money and time and I'm not sure I'm gonna be open. Uh, so, you know, how much, you know, should I grow? Is my soils gonna dry out all these, these uh, risks? So I really feel, you know, and I have a buyer, I can buy, you know, sell to myself. So, yeah. you know, my heart goes out to the farmers, but, um, yeah. Thank you, Lil. And and we'll come back to where we take this recovery, of course. But, um, you know, it's interesting. Thomas mentioned it. You mentioned it. I was having a conversation with David Suzuki back in 2019. So no COVID insight. And uh, he said we were talking about, you know, where does he find hope? But, but what does scares him the most? And he said, I am terrified that we will have a pandemic and that pandemic 
uh, will come before we've been able to address anything else. And boy, I got to admit, there were times when I thought, really, you should have listened a little harder. Uh, Sylvain Charlebois is uh, our last panelist, and I was telling him when we started, I'm a big fan of his columns in the newspaper and have been listening to uh, Sylvain for a while now, and it's really great to have him on this panel. He is a professor in both the Faculty of Management and the Faculty of Agriculture at Dow, and uh, is the Senior Director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab, also at Dow former Dean of the Faculty of Management at Dell and was affiliated with the University of Guelph's Food Institute, which he helped co-found before he came here. He's known as the food professor and uh, his current research lies in the broad area of food distribution, security and safety of our supply. And he is one of the world's most cited scholars on supply chain management and food, food value chains and traceability. And he's not afraid to have an opinion that not everybody loves, which is what I, which is what I love about Sylvain Chalbois. Uh, Sylvain, I'm going to ask you the same question. I'm going to ask you to take a look at food systems, though, in the economy. What was positive? And you maybe have the hardest job of anyone. What was positive about that during the pandemic? Well, I, I visited the Woodman Monkey a few times. Is that <laughs> yes. a positive? Yes, I did that too. So... <laughs> On, on St. Valentine's Day with my wife, uh, of all dates. So thank you, Lil, for serving us a, a very lovely meal. We've been, I mean, we're big fans. My family and I, we've been at the Wooden Monkey uh, many times over the last five years. So we really enjoy our, our visits there. So, and thank you for being the entrepreneur you are. Uh, it's great to, to hear. Uh, positives. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think... <laughs> I think for a while, a lot of, lots of Canadians felt food insecure, uh, even though, I mean, I do research in food distribution and policy. I've always believed in this re resiliency of, of, of the food industry, food service, our restaurants, uh, the pivoting that we saw. It's, it's, it was really incredible to watch. But I was, as I was witnessing what was going on, I realized a lot of Canadians full, felt food insecure. And so what people did, well, they, they went out and bought basically a lot of food, maybe too much food led to waste for a while. We actually measured the amount of waste uh, generated from uh, March to May. We believe that the average household in Canada wasted 13.5% more oh food as a result of, of the panic buying we saw, unfortunately. However, however, We've become better inventory managers at home. We're at home. We are aware what's in our cupboards, in our fridge. Uh, when we go to the grocery store, we're more uh, educated about what we do have at home. We're not going to be buying things we don't need. So there's, there's lots of, of that going on. Our food literacy has gone up. As, as a country, we know more recipes, we've cooked more, we're more aware of where our food is coming from, we're gardening more. My goodness, the, in the Atlantic, <laughs> the gardening rate went up 18% last year. We are expecting the same uh, this year. So it's all about food literacy, it's about awareness, it's about knowing where our food is coming from. Uh, we know that mother, mother nature is not perfect, uh, which is great. We understand that growing food is not easy. <laughs> so those are, in my view, uh, at a very high level, those are, are positive things for us. All right, let's, let's flip that around then. And uh, it's interesting, you talked about knowing, being better inventory managers. I have never been more aware of what I have in my <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I don't know about you, but I can tell you what's in the freezer now, which I could never do before. What was that block of ice down at the bottom? You know, I know now yeah. uh, because we've had to figure out how long can we go without going to the grocery store, right? Like that's, that's become We're a more discipline. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So what are the negatives then uh, that have affected? Our well, I mean, I was listening to Lil and Thomas and, uh, and when we were talking about carbon emissions uh, and, yeah, and, and they're right. I mean, we do, we have traveled less and obviously it has helped the environment, but the problem is that uh, the great reset we've been talking about is not happening in Asia. Uh, a report came out today showing that China has broken the record in terms of carbon emission increase in one quarter, we're back. Uh, that's a negative for sure. Another negative, plastics. 
Plastics came back with a vengeance, uh, especially early on. And because of the fact that, you see, before the pandemic, 35% of our food budget went to food consumed outside the household at the restaurant. That went down to 9% in March, April, and May. Now it's up to about 24%. So the split between service and retail is 2476. My concern is that I don't think we've, uh, we've reached uh, the, the plastic sweet spot, allowing both grocers and food service to, to use less plastics because people are so concerned about public health for the right reasons, obviously, it's we're dealing with a pandemic, but me, people are very focused on, on risks, the virus and variants, and, and the environment really took a back seat for a while. I, when you talk to industry, I don't think industry in general have kept on working on measures and, and how to actually become better environmental stewards, but... Canadians were scared and were very, and there's many, many, many Canadians are still concerned about what's going on right now. So that certainly is a big negative for me. Fascinating. You're absolutely right. I've forgotten the whole plastics uh, sort of issue. And I remember early in the pandemic, you know, they wouldn't take my reusable coffee mug. Exactly. Uh, I remember thinking, oh gosh, we're all, all going to go back to disposable cups. We've gained too much to do that. And yet there was a very good reason. I understood why they couldn't take it. Uh, but yeah, it, we've got to be careful that learned behavior isn't unlearned. Okay, one more round with one question and we'll ask everyone to sort of keep it to a couple of lines so we can get the uh, four of you talking together. We'll start with you again, Megan. What do you think going forward to the reset of the recovery? that's terrifying what we just heard about China. Uh, what will help us from your perspective address climate change post pandemic? Yeah, so the biggest thing for increasing cycling is safe protected infrastructure. And so there's a lot of other kind of programming and things that we can add um, to support people in choosing cycling as a mode of transportation. Um, but safe infrastructure is number one. So that's that's our main priority and it's it'll continue to be so during and after the pandemic. Do you have more advocates now than you had pre-pandemic? Like, do you have more people who will say, yes, I want this? <laughs> um, it's an interesting thing. So we know that more people are cycling um, and we know that bike shops are sold out and things like that, but because we can't do as many in-person outreach activities, we as an organization are not necessarily reaching all of those folks. So we've been trying to find ways that we can connect with people online. Um, we started a Slack internally. So all of our members are, are invited to that. Um, so we are finding new ways to communicate with people, um, but it is harder um, if someone just buys a bike and maybe they haven't, they don't even know we exist. Um, normally we would be doing like in-person outreach and um, popping up near bike lanes and things like that. Um, so we haven't been able to do as much of that. Okay. Thomas, uh, what lessons, what, um, how do we harness what we learned to move forward post pandemic to fight climate change? I mean, very specifically to fight it. Yes, so I think we have to, um, you know, uh, Sylvain just said the rebound. It, it, it's a scary part that we are just getting back to where we were. And, and I hope we can really turn this around, especially for Nova Scotia. We know there will be a new economy. We know it. Um, combustion engine cars will be gone in 10 years, and there's no question about it. Um, my question is why in Nova Scotia we have to be the last, we can be the first. Um, I, I'm actually myself concentrating on two things. I, I think renewable energy is something really good for, for, for Nova Scotia, in particular for municipalities, if we can uh, keep this local. And actually the other one is, is food security. So. Uh, you know, the, these uh, little startups I helped to, to, to start, um, um, they, uh, it, it just was, I, I believe so much that we can do so many things. So uh, we have, for example, horizontal farming. We have in, in Nova Scotia, some really good examples, um, uh, aquaponics. Uh, so local food production, I think technology can help there a lot. We, we applied um, artificial intelligence methods to that. I think this will help us uh, to, do low density farming or high productivity farming in uh, indoors. 
So there's a lot of really entrepreneurship. I, I wish our province would invest in, in that and not just you know the next uh, Google or so, which explodes all over the world. We have a real opportunity in Nova Scotia and, and I'm trying to, uh, I have a sabbatical coming up and really uh, work actually on these, uh, these kind of things. It's interesting too, because we started by kind of making a bit of a joke about all of us figuring out how Zoom works. But I wonder if we will start to see less business travel because people can use this. I mean, I, don't, I hope we don't stop meeting each other face to face, but uh, that will be another one. It, do you get a sense, Thomas? I mean, and I'm the wrong person to ask too, because any, you know, I've been too close to the politicians for too long. But are we seeing the people in power believing that they should now get ahead of the curve, be investing in, in this? Because I'm watching leading edge entrepreneurs in this province popping up everywhere, you know, making products over recycled plastic, you know, doing land-based uh, fish farming, do, you know, doing these creative things that are revolutionary around the world, but they don't seem to be the ones that are getting all the attention. Exactly. Yeah, I have a lot of um, discussion with my friends about this, how uh, we could do things so much better. We have really, we have, we have world-class entrepreneurs here. Yeah. And they are not supported in the way, and, and uh, it's a long discussion why, I would love to have this, <laughs> but I, I, um, I'm also, uh, here, here's one more, more thing, um, I, I really believe that we have opportunities, but uh, unfortunately politicians, you know, they say no all nice words, now the liberals are the most green, we don't need greens anymore, <laughs> here's, here's something you have to watch out for, uh, setting targets and just talking about we will do, doesn't mean anything doesn't mean anything what we have to talk about it what are we exactly going to do take the action so if we want to be reducing a certain percentage what do we do today and do it and unfortunately nobody talks about how we are just setting targets far off out you know when most of us will be retired and you know yeah. anyhow so that that's a critical part how, what are we really starting now to, to uh, you know, what, what will be the new economy? And yeah. we have to start it now. And people have to ask for it. Okay, Lil, uh, how do we fight climate change and make sure that we learn from how important it was to support local, to make sure that we are showing our farmers we need them, we want them. Um, what do we do in the reset? Yeah. Well, I mean, just, just, I just need to say this, um, that of all the industries in the whole wide world, everything in the world, the most industry that will be affected by climate change is agriculture because it's weather driven. We need a stable climate to grow food. So, so for me, food is it. But I will tell you about the most exciting uh, meeting I've ever been to and the biggest solution I think we all, the world needs to talk about and is talking about is there soil scientists all over the world now, uh, you know, discovering how powerful the soil is to sequester carbon. It is a game changer. I went to this meeting in Copenhagen 10 years ago where I heard seven countries talk about this, about small scale sustainable farmers are cooling down the planet. And I was like, what the hell are they talking about? And they started to unfold the story about animals in motion, Serengeti, you know, uh, uh, management uh, uh, grasslands. And, and it is now they're measuring it. And it's, it is, it is, I was so excited. I could have flew home without the plane. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> because as a climate presenter, I, I get out and I look up the sky all the time. And I see those over like 415, we're way above that. And when I started doing this climate stuff, we were like, it was be below 400. So we have to sequester it. We've got to get it down. And agriculture is the only technology on the planet that can safely do that and feed us better nutritional food. It, it is, it is store, it's, it's amazing. And I have some stats to back it up, but it's, <laughs> it's and, really- and I think- she does know what she's talking about, but but it's true, Lil. It, it's still, it's not mainstream yet, which I can't. You know, the first time you told me this, oh I looked. God. I started looking into it, and I thought she's right, but we're not talking about it. Okay, I'm going to move to Sylvain on that note because I'm sure he'll want to jump in here. But you know, Sylvain, I heard the 
five thirty or six o'clock news tonight tell me hurricane season's about to start early and that we're, they've named the first one and we're about to have seven or eight hurricanes by the time we hit september and i kind of went if you talk about food supply being affected by weather that's got to be a nightmare uh if you're a person who studies food supply oh absolutely i mean lil is right i mean climate change uh, with agriculture agriculture it will be affected severely by by climate change. And that's why we need to think about, you know, our food autonomy. Uh, we've, we've been talking a lot about food security or food insecurity in our region. But uh, what, what I've been hearing a lot in our lab, we've had the pleasure to work with New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta, not Nova Scotia, not yet, on food autonomy related projects. And what that means, it's, it's really about using technologies to produce food all year round. We are uh, in Canada. It's challenging to grow things all year round, but there are technologies that do exist for, to allow green technologies to allow us to grow food all year round and entice Canadians to buy local all year round. You see, in our studies, we realize people want to buy local. They actually are willing to pay a premium even for local foods. However, Canadians aren't hardwired to look for local foods. When, as they walk into the grocery store, life kicks in. They have kids, they're pressed for time, they're, they'll look for the better deal. They don't necessarily look for local products because they're hardwired to think that strawberries are grown in June and July and that's it. And they don't really think about local that much. So as we, what, what I've seen over the last uh, several months are huge investments from McCain with Goodleaf, uh, which started in, in Truro, by the way, Bible Hill. It's now in Guelph. They're investing $30 million in projects in Calgary, Florenceville, and Longueuil, Quebec. Uh, Doucette is building a $25 million facility in the Quebec region as well to grow more food all year round. The reason why this is happening now is that for Probably the first time in our history, we've realized that our dependency on labor at Farmgate is really pushing us away from a better focus on capital and capital access. All of these investments, all of these projects, they had there was they were private investors and government as well. And this is why we're seeing more and more of these projects. And I, I feel pretty plump about what's going to happen next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we do need to look for the bright spots, right? And the changing climate is going to change how we see what we can grow and who can grow it and how we grow it in sustainable amounts. Um, right now, we're going to take sort of a, an open round where I'm going to ask panelists who want to raise something with each other or comment because you've uh, you've been hearing me ask the questions. So I'm gonna open the floor um, and and feel free to jump in where you see the crossover in particular among your area of in amongst your Can, can I can yes, I start? start to that. Yes, start. Yeah, I have I have a question for my colleague Thomas. Uh, I mean the the issue of listening to science uh, is certainly a sensitive one for me because, of course, we have to listen to science, but science is not an absolute, as you know, Thomas. I mean, <laughs> science, so to, to get politicians to listen to science, they may be wrong with time. <laughs> that's, the, that's the challenge. But what I'm seeing, and I want to know if you agree with me, is that there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of parties or a lot of people who are actually weaponizing uh science using science to support a narrative of some sort and they're ignoring other parts of science in order to feel more confident about their own narrative what what are your thoughts on that yeah very very good point um i should say that i see science very much changing and scientists changing um when when i started studying it was kind of the holy grail was you know that we are uh, always asking ourselves, is it really, you know, is, is this true and what are the assumptions? And we are always, you know, I am still today always say we might be completely wrong. So we are always open minded. Now, I should say also that um, uh, we need politicians uh, because politics means something else. It means taking all the, uh, you know, the, the scientific facts, but also 
of course, the needs of the society into account. So I, I, I also appreciate that, okay? <laughs> My point therefore was that what is missing is the openness. It's the really collaborative saying, okay, this science says this one, and, and here are the other facts, and that we all know the facts. And what, what you just said is, is, this is not done. Indeed, it is just cherry picked and say, science is saying this one and then science saying the other one. We're, so, we're treating science like a buffet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it is the openness and the truthfulness, um, which is really at the heart of, of what is missing, I think, and scares me. Yeah, it's an interesting point you both made. I'm going to uh, ask Megan and Lil if they want to weigh in on that. But I do think um, we've seen it in COVID, right? The minute something changes and we have one of our public health officers say, our new, you know, let's take AstraZeneca for example, the new science, you know, the latest from science is telling us, and then they get accused of holding out or changing their mind or being wishy-washy, whereas you say, Thomas, from a scientific point of view, they're just moving forward. But the public appetite is, well, well, you must have been lying before because now you're telling me something different. And that's, that's tricky business. Um, I don't, I feel for the scientists. Um, it's hard enough for journalists, but it's hard for scientists. All right, Megan and Lil, do you want to take on the science versus public perception, or is there another way you want to take this? Uh, well, I can start, I guess. I, I'm personally nervous. Uh, I mean, I believe in science for sure, certain science, certain scientists, but I'm really worried that science, a lot of science being paid by industry. Uh, that's a big concern for me. And I, I, I've heard many scientists uh, that are freer and older and, and retired talk about that. So that makes me, you know, right now there's a, there's a, a debate now going up and in, 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 uh, in allowing uh, Monsanto or, or genetically modifying companies to, to do their own research and to basically patent their own things. Say, we're, we're good. We've done the science. We're okay. That to me is really dangerous. You can't have industry you know, policing themselves. I mean, I'd like to do my own health uh, inspections in restaurants. <laughs> We're not allowed, <laughs> you know, like, we, you know, so I, I just find that uh, that worries me terribly. Yeah. So That's industry true. should not do their own science. I think real scientists. So, yeah, yeah, I think that kind of applies across industries too. I, I, yeah. I know that I, years ago, yeah. we had a great debate about whether, you know, uh, abattoirs could be inspected by the companies that bought the beef. No, no, that's no. probably not a good idea. <laughs> Megan, do you, how do you feel about this whole question of whether we're weaponizing science? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of how to apply it to a kind of transportation question. Um, and I think one of the one of the points that was brought up was interesting to me where the science is always changing. So we're always kind of learning new things and it's not necessarily that someone was wrong or misinforming, but we've learned something new along the way. Um, so we see that a lot in urban planning. And so it is it is top of mind for me um, as an advocate and I'm trying to create change. Are we doing the right thing? Um, are we really thinking this through? Um, one of the big examples in Halifax um, of something that was deemed to be a good thing at the time um, is we can look to the example of Africville. And of course, now we can look at that and say that was a horrific thing that was done um, by the city. Um, but at the time, I'm sure people had the best of intentions. I'm, I'm gonna make that assumption. Um, so, you know, we're, we're trying to impact our city and, and build a place that's, that's uh, healthy and sustainable and, um, you know, a nice place to live for everyone. So just kind of making sure that we're checking in on, on how, how we're advocating for that and, um, and who's gonna benefit from, from different changes that we're trying to make. It, it's interesting the point you make too because the lens through which we see something, we don't always see what the consequences will be. Um, and that is, you know, the suburbs was, were seen as wonderful ways for people to have inexpensive housing. And right now we are talking about affordable housing and where do we put it and by having people in the suburbs because they had automobiles they could drive to work and they could live in nicer homes if they were further away but we now know by separating home and work we created something a societal change that we're now grappling with right 
uh, the Cogswell interchange is about to come down. I'm sure it was a good idea at the time too. Uh, okay, I'm going to say as we as we wrap this part up that if you have a question that you would like to put to uh, our panelists, now's the time to put it in the chat or uh, if you raise your hand, I should see it and we, you can ask it in person, but either way, maybe double do it. Put it in the chat. Maybe meanwhile, and yes. can I just, uh, just first of all, Megan, a, a, a nice thing. We have always been open for changes. That's That was a really good point. Mm -hmm. And and Lil, just uh, for scientists, you know, real scientists, usually we don't have hidden agendas. We want to understand things. Oh, yeah. but, but we have, for example, a chair of Cook Aquaculture, who is the only scientist who, who tells us that, um, you know, open pen fish farms are safe. So I'm worried about this too. Yeah, good. But now we have John Risley telling us that they're not. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Greg has asked if anyone has a question to please put it in the chat. Um, and Greg, I'm going to, yes, you have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> I do have a question. Um, thank you all for a wonderful panel discussion. I'm another one of those scientists that you're just talking about. I'm involved in marine science. And one of the things that I found very interesting at the beginning of the pandemic was uh, what happened to the fishing industry in that they had to limit the number of hands on board their vessels and they can go out fishing a lot of these vessels, especially the very large ones um, that are fishing abroad and you had breakouts on board these vessels. And, and I saw that as a real opportunity to um, endorse small scale fishing, more localized, keep those fishermen closer to shore, smaller scale, smaller boats. And then we're not off exploiting halfway around the world in these mass massive factory vessels. And I want, I'm wondering if either Lil or Sylvain could comment on um, the impact that COVID has had on um, like staffing at, at farms. Um, we've seen, I, I've seen back in Ontario where my family is from, where there were massive outbreaks um, because they had people in, in small quarters and there were migrant workers and this sort of thing. And so I saw that in the fishing community. I'm wondering um, what we can do about that. Is the aim to have smaller scale agriculture or what? Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll start with Lily and then go to Sylvain. No? I always, uh, yeah, I vote for small scale agriculture. And 70% and, uh, of the food that's that's uh, the, the world is eating is from small family farms in the world. We already feed the world. And so uh, I, I vote for that. And, and there's so many examples that are fantastic that small scale family farms, 100 acres, 200 acres, are feeding tremendous amounts of food with the permaculture, organic, uh, regenerative agriculture, because it produces a lot, very, very high dense nutritional food, fresh. It's just, to me, that's the way to go. Uh, it's, it's really important. I, I think we need to go there. And look at, at Cargill, uh, one of the, I think it was the largest outbreak in, in North America with the, with the pandemic. So, you know, do a lot of reading on Cargill. It's just uh, from, from the animals, uh, to the people, it's in the world and the workman's compensation. It's the second most dangerous place to work in Canada. So, you know, I think small scale farming, it's definitely just even as a restaurant, just growing to two restaurants from 30 employees to 70 employees, it's larger, harder to manage. So when things get bigger, they are harder to manage and they get out of control. So I think we can do a good job with small scale farming. That's my vote anyway. And Sylvain. Yeah, no, I I appreciate uh, what uh, Lil is saying. I I've 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 been more of, of an advocate for for a mixture of different models. Uh, I'm a big fan of cooperatives, uh, but I've always been concerned about uh, food affordability. Also, mm -hmm. uh, obviously, um, large scale farms tend to be more efficient. Uh, but at the same time, what we're seeing with the pandemic is that there is this hunger, no pun, uh, from people who uh, have lived in cities for many years going back to uh, rural 
Canada. I mean, because they, they want they want the farm. Uh, Lil is is doing just that. Wanting farm. we we actually own a, a farm in Quebec as well. My wife and I, and and this is something. This is there's a movement uh, from mm -hmm. from cities going back to agriculture, uh, taking ownership, which is kind of nice. But I, I don't I don't necessarily believe we can live uh, only by ha having sm small farms. I mean, smart farms are disappearing in Canada just because it's, it's just a lot of farms actually compete at the global level. Uh, and uh, we have an open economy in Canada. We're 38 million people in the largest country in the world. So from a food system perspective, I've, I've always believed that it's important to develop our food autonomy, but at the same time, agriculture, uh, it wasn't the Barton report. It is, is, is a great opportunity to create job and support our economy over the long term we, we, we have but we have to do it right and we have to do it green all right thank you emily Ferron. you have your hand up so you get to ask your question now <laughs> thank you so much thank you joanne and thank you greg for organizing this panel and all the panelists i have really enjoyed this conversation um i have a question about food um and <laughs> i personally am a big believer in advocating for real climate action from our elected officials um, and taking large scale action like that. But as an individual, I'm very interested in my own, you know, where I'm getting my food. Can I make stuff on my own? <laughs> oh my God, should I buy a farm? <laughs> and I can find myself getting overwhelmed with <laughs> how many things I could do. And, you know, it feels like it could be a full-time job just developing my own food system where, you know, acquiring things. So um, from your expert opinions, how does an individual not get overwhelmed, but also do the most that we could within reason? <laughs> uh, that, that's a really good question. I think it's a question certainly um, that your generation is asking way more than we did. So yeah. good on you. Uh, one thing I will pass on as a resource, and I don't have the link here, but maybe Sylvan would. New Brunswick um, has a food, uh, a New Brunswick sort of round table on food that has put out the first in Canada comparison uh, of what the footprint is of the food that you consume. And um, they were shocked when they found out that that was the case because they wanted people to be able to make choices based on their values. And um, so I think it's something we should probably start to share uh, and maybe encourage our own province to take a look at some of our foods in this province and what they mean. But uh, let me go around to my panel. Megan, why don't we start with you? What do you think uh, are some of the solutions to not feeling like you have to go and start a farm or but you want to do something personal? Yeah, I've um, been really interested in food issues as well. Um, and I guess one of the things that I've done, it, I mean, it depends on your circumstance and it depends a lot on your living situation and what kind of space you have to grow food. I guess that's a big part of it. Um, so I've done a lot of balcony gardening. <laughs> um, you know, you can grow a lot of tomatoes, a lot of herbs. Um, peas and beans and things like that. 31% of new gardeners use bal a balcony. So you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so I guess like, like anything, it's, you know, taking smaller steps towards the larger change that you want to make. Um, and so finding those kind of small, small things that you can do. Um, also like canning some stuff, maybe you can't grow a whole farm's worth of food, but you could um, go to like a strawberry you pick and pick your own strawberries and make strawberry jam and things like that. So these are all small things, but I think it all contributes to um, feeling like you have a sense of, um, you know, you've really put love and care into what you're eating um, and that you're supporting local farms and um, yeah. Doing I have a lot of faith in the younger generations. They're the ones uh, who are going to push yeah. Uh, for change. Uh, when I'm, I'm from the Generation X, uh, I grew up thinking that spam and cheese whiz was actually food. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but the millennials and the Generation Zs basically pushed back and said, this is not good enough food industry. Oh. Give me something better, something more sustainable. And, and I think that push is only going to grow. Thomas earlier mentioned that 
the people in power uh, need to uh, want to change. Well, to me, the people in power are the consumers. It, at the end of the day, consumers should be empowered through social media. They should actually use that power. And millennials and the Dredge Race and Zed absolutely understand that. Yeah, actually, I'm going to go to Ron Bulmer has put a question in the chat, Ronald Bulmer, and he kind of touches on that, Sylvain, because as he said, shows the Canadian public is more supportive of measures to combat climate change than our politicians. That is true. Any thoughts on how we, pol we bring politicians to act more assertively on this? And... Um, <laughs> I, I could, I'm going to try and be not too, too partisan on this one, but I think Thomas and I would both agree that, you know, as, and I'll quote David Suzuki here, we wish the Green Party didn't have to exist, because if all parties were taking this seriously, then they could argue amongst themselves about the best way forward, but they're not. And I think right now, one of the biggest changes, when we see it in PEI, we see it in New Brunswick, we're seeing it in BC, we see it in Ontario, where they have elected Greens in not huge numbers, but they're having an impact on politicians who worry about getting votes. And if your vote's going to go to a politician who stands up for the environment and who truly wants to fight climate change and not just, you know, give it lip service, then that will hold other politicians to account. But Thomas, you take a shot at that. I'm yeah. sure I also, you know, so, this is a slippery slope. Of course, this is why we, we, we are active in the Green Party. I can just say, yes, do not believe these old politicians. You know, uh, people who are in the Green Party, I mean, we are a small party. It's very hard to get elected. We are putting a lot of work in. Why? Because we truly believe in it. And don't just, uh, you know, if you start voting for these old, you know, old type of politics um, who are now saying they're all green, you know, <laughs> just start voting for what you really believe in it. And, and that's, that's the most important. By the way, Thomas, the official opposition doesn't believe in climate change. No, apparently not. Well, they, court, came apparently. they came yeah. to Halifax just to vote for that. <laughs> but, but, and that's the important thing, nearly all the members of the conservatives do um, yeah. do as uh, nearly as many believe in climate change you know it is what the party puts on there and the, uh, you know but but the people and this is where we come back to the people people do now believe and it is really in the power of the people to to do that so yeah it, it, so it is we, we need to start and you know i'm gonna hopefully write a book about this whole thing but we have to start believing in the power we have as individuals, you talked about it as consumers, you know, uh, if when consumers decided that, you know, they wanted to have yogurt and kombucha, two things we didn't use to have very much of in this country, suddenly even the big, big business said, we, we better provide this, they want this. And, you know, when we look at, green at bin. yeah, look at green bins, we look were, at we, we were rocking. Totally. We, we took that on. No I, problem. Was, I was so severe. I thought store-bought cookies were way better than anything my mother ate. And I insisted <laughs> she buy them because it didn't look good to take like homemade cookies to school. I wanted store-bought. Well, that is completely turned around now. Anyway, let's get on to Ella Dotson here. Ella says, many coastal cities are no longer permitting development and housing along the coast uh, where the development can be flooded. Uh, any thoughts on HRM's approaches to development? And as the city planner on the panel, Megan, I'm gonna let you have first go with that one. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm actually not that familiar with their specific kind of regulations on building near the coastline. Um, so I don't know that I can speak to it in too much depth, um, but yeah, I, th I think it's an issue. I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that the city's been working on in the last few years is called the center plan. And so um, they've been working to develop um, kind of up updated planning regulations and zoning for the regional center. So downtown Halifax and, um, or yeah, Halifax Peninsula and downtown Dartmouth. And then once they have that wrapped up, um, which is hopefully uh, in the next year or so, um, my understanding is that they're gonna be working on uh, more, um, planning regulations for other parts of the municipality. So it's it's really hard in Halifax um, to, to do a blanket kind of plan for the whole area because it's so vast and 
you know, we have the urban and the suburban and the rural spaces. So um, I'm hoping that as they as they move forward with some of those planning um, documents in the more rural places um, that are along those lines, that will be addressed. Yeah, uh, and I think it, it's also a good reminder to people if you're looking to build or buy, ask to see a floodplain map. Um, all municipalities now are putting them together. Not all of them are making them public. Um, so it's, it's incumbent on all of us to ask. And I'll tell you who's really driving this right now is the insurance industry. They are being absolutely inundated and all of our insurance rates are gonna reflect it. They cannot afford to keep paying out flood insurance. So they will probably, they're asking government for change and uh, they'll be driving this, but they'll also be starting to be tough, I think um about that ella goes on to say much of the land being developed uh, for the cogswell interchange is at sea level and and ella's absolutely right we're having a hard time as a coastal city deciding what's mitigation what's defense and and what is changing how we do things i mean many cities now are saying we'll only put recreation along our waterfronts because if it floods then we can wait for the waters to recede and it's not hard to uh but we're continuing in halifax to put fairly large built infrastructure along our waterfront and uh, yes yeah, i see thomas nodding thomas yeah, you know <laughs> Yes. Uh, we have detailed simulations of of the change of the um, of our uh, of the floodplains, and uh, this is again something. We are scientists. This this is actually very straightforward. Um, and and also, I, I noticed that the insurance. I think the insurance companies um, are, are really now warning people. You actually won't get any more insurance if you're on a floodplain. But here's another interesting thing. We had a, a we have a well known climate act green climate activist actually on the um, Richard Sorowski who was on the on the council and um, you know there was a lot of activity uh, first declaring that there is an emergency and Richard then asked the next step so what are we now going to do about it and since he's not anymore there suddenly everything uh, uh, slowed down again so yeah. here again how important it is to get the right people in also our legislature yeah Lil yeah, well, I, uh, when I ran for mayor uh, a couple of years ago, I talked a lot about development and good development, bad development. And, and uh, I spoke about, you know, the, the buildings that are going up that went up, you know, just even the last 10 years are all uh, climate change disasters. They're built, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing clean and green about them except for the library. You know, but it, it was, it's really, uh, we've really lost the vision. Every new building should be, you know, be able to handle their own water system and waste system and have green roofs and just like, you know, some places in the rest of the world. But can I just have a second? I wanted to go back to this woman yes. that was about the food. I just wanted to let that, let her know that there is, you know, being a climate presenter, people get overwhelmed by looking at melting glaciers because it's really overwhelming. And I bring people right to the plate in front of them. The plate, if you hold a, a key or a fork, what makes most emissions is the fork. It's over 50% now with industrial agriculture. So I go to the market being a restaurant owner, got a lot of price checking. That's my business, especially the way I run my business. And the farmer's markets, the prices are in, at par or lower than the grocery store. And I'll mention Ted Hutton for one, I'll, I'll, I'll call his name out. His vegetables are phenomenal. He's one of the most uh, fantastic farmer we have in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And he, a lot of his vegetables are lower than the superstore, fresher. You know, it, it's just, uh, it, it's, you know, you can go and, and learn to cook more, buy vegetables, cooking right, making, making a chicken, uh, chicken dinner and then making a soup and making other things with that. So it's all about preparation and, and meal planning, but you can make the most difference in climate change by just the way you eat, definitely, than buying a hybrid car. A uh, little, you know what, I've, I've indulged this group and taken them over 15 minutes and I am going to now, uh, Emily says, thank you very much. Thank you, Lil, for getting back to her question. And I wanna thank, I wanna thank the Halifax EDA uh, for holding this panel, for Greg Puncher for putting it together. And I certainly, I, 
I know that we're we're all a little over zoomed sometimes, and to have Megan Doucette and Lil McPherson and Sylvain Charlebois and Thomas Trappenberg be willing to take this time to come and share this, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. It has been a dynamic conversation. Uh, you've all brought so much to the table. So uh, it has been recorded. Tell your friends, make them go listen to it. Uh, and we will uh, get their feedback. So thank you all very much. And Greg, over to you. Thank you so much, Joanne. And thank you to all of our panelists. I just wanted to finish by echoing what uh, Joanne already has said in that uh, the uh, session has been recorded and it will be featured on our YouTube channel. So the Halifax EDA Green Party has a YouTube channel. We have our previous panel uh, discussion on there as well. And uh, you can see announcements for future discussions and video releases uh, on our Instagram or on Facebook. Uh, you can also contact uh, the uh, Halifax EDA by email and become um, uh, part of the, the newsletter uh, group. So there you go. Follow us. There's going to be a lot more coming. And uh, thank you once again to all of our panelists. I learned a lot this evening. Yeah, me too. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.